I feel that this is history repeating itself almost exactly. Not only because of the, uh, we are fortunate from, from Bigfoot experience in that the improved communications and modern technology has afforded us a second chance. You know, everything that has transpired here is exactly history repeating itself. Uh, the way I feel about it spiritually is Bigfoot spirit is still here and his people's spirits are still here and very much alive. And I believe that they are, in fact, the ones protecting us. We are suffering the same hardships they suffered. Starvation, hunger, inadequate shelter, inadequate warmth, uh, same inclement type weather, the same harassment surrounding by uh, much more firepower than, than they had. Uh, the fact that they were forced to surrender and give up all their arms and then were massacred. See, we're not going to make that the same mistake. If they're going to massacre us, we're going to take some people with us. Now, we provided the forum here for the uh, Sioux people to to address their redress of grievances, you know. And at that time, it's the 1868 treaty or nothing. Originally, the Civil Rights Organization of the Oglala Sioux Tribe and the Interdistrict Council and the Landowners Association, all three which represent anywhere from 80 to 85 percent of the total Indian population of the reservation, asked us to come in to help them provide a forum for their redress of grievances. They had previously been involved in an internal struggle with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the tribal government of which they uh, illegally were prevented from a redress of their grievances. So consequently, the court of last resort in Indian country has always been the American Indian movement. And therefore, we were asked to come in the first time ever to come in on a reservation. And we came here, met for two days with the tribal, the traditional tribal chiefs and the um, holy men of this reservation. I was there for two days. At 7.30 p.m. on February 27th, it was decided to come into Wounded Knee, and we were here within the hour. And your plans were what? Our plans at that time was to ask that the high interior department officials come here to negotiate with us, along with the senators. The senators came. The interior department officials refused to. And that was to create immediate change that Indian people could feel and see insofar as the land is concerned, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is concerned, and the tribal government is concerned. You mentioned earlier that you met with the traditional tribal chiefs here, but you didn't mention Dick Wilson. He's not one of the traditional leaders. No, he isn't. The traditional leaders are, are hereditary and appointed by the communities themselves. There's people like Iron Cloud, Red Cloud, uh, Fool's Crow, uh, uh, Kill's Enemy. These are the traditional chiefs that have come down from the last century. One of the things that you would like to see is the ouster of Dick Wilson, is that correct? That is a mute, mute question now. So how long do you see Wounded Knee continuing as it is now? What is it going to take before there is something definitely done uh, for the Indian and Wounded Knee? Wounded Knee will not be over until either they, one, massacre us, two, address our treaty rights by law, according to law, according to United States law. What do you think is going to be necessary to do to get some, the Department of the Interior and the Bureau to recognize your aims and, and your goals? We're no longer dealing with the Department of Interior. We're no longer dealing with any of the subordinate departments of the federal government. According to our treaty rights, we are to deal with the President of the United States and or his designated representative which has power over Justice, Interior, or HEW, or anyone else. And this is whom we have, we have asked that Hank Adams be appointed by the President, be this negotiator, 
uh, our, our special supervisor, as it's worded in our treaty rights. You want the president, his office, to negotiate with you. Would you be satisfied with President Nixon putting his signature on a document, uh, making promises to look into the grievances? Would you be satisfied with that? Definitely not. President Nixon lied to us once before when we left Washington, D.C. in November. Now, each one of those conditions were, uh, were abrogated, that uh, agreements he, he, we reached with him in White House negotiations, and also the reply to our 20-point solution problem to the government's problem in Indian affairs was, uh, was answered in the most ambiguous manner that I think history can record. Uh, no, Nixon's going to have to come, come across with more, more than promises. He has to come across with results. Is it true that you've declared this area a separate nation from the United States government? The Indian people have always had sovereignty. It's been quasi-sovereignty as defined by the, the Supreme Court of the United States that we are, in fact, dependent domestic nations. How we feel that we can, based on our, our land holdings, we are independent, we can and will be independent nation. Uh, we're just going based on 1868 treaty, which makes us an independent nation. Now, until that treaty is addre addressed to, we will remain here in Wounded Knee. Now, if you're a separate nation, will you want any kind of federal aid? Where were they? Oh, no, I don't know. No, only in terms of what the diplomats arrange, you know, foreign aid or whatever. But mainly you want your land back. How much land? The, the land question has to be resolved in, in extended treaty negotiations about our treaty rights. Now, western South Dakota from the east bank of the Missouri River, according to our treaty, is our land. That has to be settled. Now, so do you see other wounded knees a settlement is reached here? Mm -hmm. uh, I see other wounded knees going to continue until the United States addresses itself to the treaty rights of Indian people all over the United States. This is one of 371 treaties ratified by the Congress of the United States, which make, it, make them the law of the land, equal to and on par with the Constitution of the United States of America. What if the demands are not met? Then you're going to be here for a long time. This armed conflict or this confrontation is going to continue indefinitely. I feel that uh, the Justice Department in the United States of America, we have at this time emissaries going, visiting the Organization of American States, in fact making personal ambassadors, if you will, going to, uh, to Mexico City and to Guatemala, uh, Chile, Argentina, Cuba, and, and other countries within the Organization of American States. Uh, also, we have uh, diplomats at the United Nations that uh, are trying to get our treaty heard in the, uh, in the United Nations. Are you looking for foreign aid from these countries, or just to get your side of the story across? Initially, we're looking for uh, diplomatic recognition from these uh, countries around the world. Early in the occupation, you're quoted as saying that you're willing to die here at Wounded Knee. Is this still the case? Definitely. As I stated, they either massacre us or recognize our treaty. And, and President Nixon, when he made that treaty with uh, North Vietnam, stated uh, via satellite TV to the world that the United States would live up to all its treaty commitments that it has already made. And we construed that to state that he would also live up to the Indian treaties. So, consequently, you see, one thing you can't get the Indian to understand is how they can make a treaty with North, North Vietnam and 
pour in bil billions of dollars of reparation and at the same time disregard the treaties made with Indian people and withdraw millions of dollars from the congressional allocations and appropriations. <laughs>